This is the Roaring Elephant Podcast, and here is my soon-to-be thoroughly certified, or actually, should he be certified, co-host, Jon. Well, I've been told I'm certifiable. Is that the same thing? I think so. I think so. <laughs> as long as it gets you a special jacket and a quiet room to yourself, that's that's all that makes pad, sense. Padded room, padded room. I yeah. Like, I like exactly. softness all around me. Exactly. Perfect. Perfect for a, a long weekend away. So, yes, we are continuing our uh, conversation around the 2021 Open Source Jobs Report from the Linux Foundation and edX. And we're getting into the second half of this now, and it is the training and certification part. Yeah, maybe just to get it off my, off my chest, uh, it's clear that these two organizations have built this report. The first part, which we talked about in a previous episode, was primarily uh, organized, orchestrated, managed by the Linux Foundation, and this one has much more of an EDX flavor. Now, yeah. I'm not sure if everybody knows EDX. Uh, maybe spend a couple of minutes on that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a self-learn portal. That's what I call them. It's like a Coursera. Uh, you have O'Reilly does some stuff there as well. LinkedIn has some training courses now too. This is, uh, edX is kind of the same thing. It's a cooperation of a couple of universities in the US that have put their co curriculums online, let's say. But there's a lot of companies that also jumped on that. I know, for instance, that Microsoft has a lot of stuff on there. Uh, have a look at them at your own uh, peril. Uh, but for instance, when I started in the whole big data world, I actually got my first real certifications from edX doing some Apache Spark courses. I remember that, actually. I remember you doing those. I was even a teaching assistant there. I was so good at the yeah. course, the teachers actually asked me if I could help other people. I remember. I remember. <laughs> wow, I haven't been on them for a ago. while now. It's a long time ago because... At a certain point, I mean, I, I do like these organizations because they are allowing people to build a basis of skills. Uh, make sure you do good uh, due, due diligence on looking who's giving the courses, if they're purely promotional or if there's actually some <laughs> interesting information in there. Because again, the Microsoft uh, clip I just made, those are not the best ones I've done there. Um, but there is a lot, of, a lot there. And of course, they have some competition as well. But apparently, edX sponsored this report as well. So uh, good for them. Indeed. Indeed. Well, we hinted towards this a couple of times through the actual, uh, through our previous session, where we were talking about um, you know, the shortage of open source professionals, sort of shortage of open source professionals. Wow, it's actually quite difficult to say. Um, and how that is affecting the job market, how that's affecting hiring managers and what people are doing about it. And a big part of it is the increased focus on the development and training and certification of both new employees and uh, for those employees that people are looking to hire and for uh, existing employees in terms of you know, retention. Mm -hmm. So unsurprising, it's, a, <laughs> it's a, a report written by the Linux Foundation who have their own programs uh, within edX. Uh, they, they think that this is a good thing. And you know, I don't, I don't disagree. Like I, I, my personal view is that I always look for real world experience over a bunch of certifications. You know, I, I think certifications are useful. I think they are an interesting indicator, but I would rather you know, talk about someone's real world experiences, what they've actually built, what they've actually done, um, and, you know, be able to back channel and verify some of that as well, um, than purely relying on, oh, someone's got this great big long list of, as, of certifications. Great. Let's hire them immediately. Yeah. I mean, I agree that it's definitely, you, you look at this, you look at certifications differently as a hiring tool or a retention tool. Mm -hmm. So focusing on the hiring part first, um, I hate them. Because it's a hiring manager tool. 
the idea of a certification is I don't need to know anything about whatever this person needs to be doing because if he checks these boxes with certifications, apparently somebody else has told, uh, can tell me that they are qualified for this job. Mm -hmm. And if it's used in that fashion, it's horrible because certifications are not certifications. They are very much different ways of certifications. I mean, some certifications I actually enjoy attaining because, uh, I mean, the Red Hat Certified Engineer ones, uh, the ones at my company as well, those are on the job, do something to attain that certification. You get uh, uh, for the uh, Red Hat certification, you get a Linux system, it's broken, fix it. It really makes you not just demonstrate your knowledge, uh, but actually being able to do continue with that knowledge, do something with that knowledge, apply that knowledge, think out of the box with that knowledge and stuff like that. And those certifications are good. The thing is that you only know that once you've actually taken that exam. Mm -hmm. And most hiring managers, specifically if they're coming directly from HR, well, you can't expect these people to have taken a Red Hat Certified Engineer exam. That's basically not how that works. Because there's a lot of other uh, certifications and uh, I'm going to say it, I shouldn't, but I'm going to say it anyway, Microsoft exams are horrible. They're multiple choice and basically if you have some idea of what the thing is about, just reading the options. I mean, if you're a little bit smart, you can find the correct answer just in the potential options in the multiple choice. Because there's three out of five are totally wacky, two are very similar, there's little difference in there. It's going to be one of those two, obviously. Then just, yeah, one, two, one, two, one, two, and you can get 70% without a problem. And those certifications, in my opinion, are even, they're dangerous. They're not just value less, they're actually dangerous because they give people a lot of tools to show on their CV. And if the hiring process doesn't capture that and doesn't look at those at that real real world experience, which you can only do if you have interviews set up with people that are doing the actual job you're hiring for. It's a very dangerous thing. Yeah. Well, rant over. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, this is, um, we, we don't, we don't know anything about the particular, cert, or I don't believe that we know anything about particular certifications that this is talking about. So I think that is, uh, you know, it's generic. Up for yeah, but the unsurprising kind of stats that get flashed up here, you know, seventy-two percent of of hiring managers are like more likely to hire someone with a certification. Well, sure. <laughs> um, I'm wondering. In, I'm curious about the other statistic. How many candidates are willing to work for a company that focuses on certificates for their hiring practices? Because that will totally mm -hmm. reflect in the environment, the team I will land in. Yeah. Personally, I. I mean, if they say something like certifications are uh, are a, a pre or what you, you call it in in, in English is is an added bonus. If you have certifications, mm. great. But this is what we want, and certifications are like good bonus. If you have those, okay, cool. Why not? Yeah. And okay, fine. But if it's like be certified this 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 prerequisites. Yeah, it makes no sense. It makes no sense. I know a lot of people, and again, certain certifications are good because the training you need to do for them is actually useful and having a certification exam at the end to just make give you that little oomph to, to actually do the stuff, that's a good thing. But you really, those certifications are far in between. They're not, they're not yeah. very current, sadly. But, but this is, I mean, the, the report goes on to talk about, um, the sort of more retention and yeah. employee focused parts of this and they're um, totally positive and, and it's i don't think i've ever worked anywhere where an employer wouldn't pay for certifications like you might have to go and either do the training off your own back or Maybe you'd get a contribution towards it, or maybe you'd get it fully paid, but you could only do, you know, so many hundreds, thousands of dollars, whatever it might be, mm -hmm. um, per month, year, whatever. But most organizations, like if the employee is willing to put the work in, uh, and, you know, sometimes you can get, 
you know time off to study and and you know other things like that uh, but most organizations that I've worked with in the past have all been happy to uh, actually pay for the the certification tests themselves uh, and that it says that there's a 60% the increase in hiring managers willingness to pay for certifications 60% increase yeah, I'm not quite sure about that. Because yeah, one to two, that's 100%, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, I go one step further. When I look mm -hmm. at, a, at an employer, I want them to force me to take certifications. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be me going begging to my manager, can I please? They should be, okay, if you want to work here, we expect you to have a certification this is a multi-year plan and boom, 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 these are the ones you should take. And of course, those will be paid by the company because that will scare away certain candidates you don't want, which is a good thing. And mm -hmm. it will give me, and that's a very nice thing you said there, the free time. Because if it's something expected of me, the company can't begrudge me if I just block a week in my calendar to do the training for that thing. Yep. And that's a big problem. We talked in the last episode about how we need to upskill people and things like that. And every company I've worked for in the last uh, decade was very happy. Yes, training is important. Please train, train. And we'll give you money. You, you can go to training courses. No problem. Cool. Can I have Friday afternoon off so I can do this? Oh, no, we need you. Mm. And that at the moment is the biggest blocker, I think, for that skill gap uh, to be solved. Having you hire people, you need them. You finally found somebody who can do the job. And then you have to kind of spare what of some time away so they can actually do the training to remain that positive force. <clears throat> that's still one that's not going as well as I would hope in the industry, because I hear that from a lot of colleagues, a lot of people in the industry that, sure, I'm allowed to go train, but I kind of need to take vacation or never, I'll never get to it. And by having them have a, a program where you need to have these certifications set up, you can take those trainings and it's that actually makes me more confident that this employer will allow me to keep my skills up to date yeah i think that it's echoed by the the stats that you see here uh 92 percent of hiring managers report seeing an increase in requests for training in the past year 88 percent of hiring managers report a willingness to pay for certifications like it's this is this has become more and more important and i think the it helps that the courses and their availability have become a lot more mainstream over the years um on demand yeah on demand like you don't need to oh god you don't and you don't need to go and deal with wrangling uh, a whole bunch of uh, you know going to a physical location um taking time to you know sign into a particular course at a particular place you know Although i must admit i had things again for that uh, time boxing perspective yeah 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 true and i must admit i have i have gone to some courses in some fairly spectacular locations over the years and uh, you know i had some quite uh, quite nice trips out of them so i you know i i, I can't totally uh, totally say that that wasn't uh, that wasn't welcome in some way shape or form but for the most part yeah on demand being able to do it at a schedule that suits you rather than having to you know do everything in a particular you know one or two week block you know for some people is far more beneficial yeah but again the whole idea behind certification should not be prove that you know this thing it should be here's an opportunity to learn something and you get a nice little bonus at the end if you take the exam mm-hmm it should be all about the learning. It's, it's the road towards is more important than the final destination, right? That's the whole Zen philosophy behind it. Yeah, and that's very important here. the The report goes on to talk about the value of open source contribution, and this is something I see uh, continually evolving in the industry. Uh, you don't need to look back too far. Uh, to see a lot of organizations that were really struggling to still figure out how they could retain all of their very, very sensitive, very important, very highly patented IP. And yet their employees were 
really wanting to contribute to open source um, projects uh, and you know they themselves as an organization were consuming open source software and you know would benefit from contributing some of that code back so they didn't have to continually patch and maintain and do horrible things themselves i do think that this situation is continually improving i think more and more organizations are realizing the need to allow their developers to contribute back to open source i don't think we're fully there yet i think there's still work to be done but i do think it is incrementally improving um I'd agree. I would also add that it also depends on the kind of job. I mean, for mm -hmm. anything that's development, yes, this is something that should be allowed. And of course, for keeping IP, you should always keep some secret source, I guess. It doesn't all have to be in the open, but a lot of stuff, just the glue code, the connectors, that stuff should be able to open source it. But there are a lot of other parts of the organization, other functions where this is less important. And I'm specifically thinking about my own job. I'm a solution architect, I'm in pre-sales. For me, committing to open source is less of a... I mean, it's fun if I want to do it, but I, sh I don't feel like I should require it for yeah. but the position. It's For a developer, you might say, yeah, this is a requirement for me. I need to be able to keep in, in, in the in crowd and be seen as a respected developer and do my things. For other functions like pre-sales, I think it's less of a mandatory thing. But yeah. if, the, if the employee as an as a uh, is valuable at that point and is willing to do that there should be some room to allow for it yeah i mean we i work with you know subject matter experts in a particular field or a particular area who have contributed back to that project um and rses in a, in a pre-sales capacity it just are they contributing code all day every day no of course they're not but you know the odd tweak here the odd fix there the odd thing that they come across and it, it depends on so much it depends on their what's what's their background you know what um you know what background do they have that means that they're even able to contribute to yeah. uh, open source in the first place uh, you know everyone has that kind of background but it's uh you know where it's possible um and there's always there's always something you can contribute you can look at documentation you can look at uh, a whole variety of things it's not always about uh, hacking away at code yeah but there's also the maintenance aspects i mean if you commit code to a project you kind of also agree to maintain that code and if something changes to modify it for developers who are developing they're probably whatever they contributed still developing on that thing anyway so it's just part of the thing for a solution architect you've had an interesting project you built something to make the project work hey i've got this nice it, I'll just dump it in there, but well, pretty no, that's, sure I won't have any time to maintain it. That's so there's a difference between contributing and committing. Like you can contribute a whole bunch of stuff, right? You may not get yeah, to the actual project. Enough. Fair enough. Uh, I'm talking about stuff that actually does get accepted into upstream, and therefore the project itself takes on that mm -hmm. um, that wider uh, and yeah. longer term. For myself, I kind of made a decision to not contribute to the projects directly, but if I did something cool. I write a little blog mm -hmm. and that's not on the Roaring Elephant blog. I have multiple things on the internet. I just, I don't do it often, but sometimes I have something fun and if people find it, that's great. Fair enough. Well, the, the next kind of piece that really caught my eye was there's a figure to six, which talks about why professionals choose a career in open source. Hmm. There's a beautiful rainbow graph uh, depicting 56, 54% of professionals started their open source career because they are passionate about open source. Demonstrating this work is more than just a job to them. And 58%, so slightly higher, um, chose a career in open source because open source runs everything. It's a bold statement. Um, yeah, but if you read the text, then the, the top one, the runs everything, it's more from the point of view, which I mentioned in the, in the previous episode, where if I specialize in open source, I'll always have a job because it's everywhere. It's always being a mm -hmm. skill that's going to be required. While the first one you talked about, uh, the second high scoring one, the passionate about open source is a totally different view, of course. But together, yeah. I can see why those two are indeed, yeah, 
the reasons why people do open source. And if you look at the graph, they are also miles ahead of all the others. Yeah, yeah. The sort of it doesn't it doesn't particularly surprise me that um, the kind of third most common one is more opportunities to work remote. Mm -hmm. I think certainly previously that would have been even more prevalent. Um, and I think you know with the way the world has shifted, that's possibly a little bit less of a focus because mm -hmm. there's a lot of that everywhere. Yeah. Um, and the, the 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 rest of them are all very very close in terms of you know percentages and it's the collaborative development model i enjoy the freedom of open source the money and perks and more job opportunities um and they are all you know 25 percent, 25 percent, 24 percent, 22 percent so it's, they're all sort of in that in that mid-20s kind of ballpark mm -hmm. Uh, this is a kind of conflict with the beginning of the uh, report. Uh, here, money and perks are seen as less important, while it's apparently the only tool people have to keep their people inside, which would well, indicate that it is not that unimportant. <laughs> uh, I think it just reinforces what we talked about earlier. It reinforces the fact that, uh, you know, only 24% of people are in it for the money and the perks. Uh, uh, no, I say that uh, of everybody who's in it, 20% of the reason they're in it is the money and the perks. Yeah, okay, <laughs> I think that yeah, sounds more that's, positive. That's, that, that, that's probably better put. But the, the, the kind of curious thing here is, you know, if you went back to that conversation we had in the previous episode, you know, so what could organizations do to retain people? Um, open source runs everything and being passionate about open source. Well, like you can't really uh, weaponize, weaponize is probably the wrong term, but you can't really like use those things to retain someone because likelihood is they're going to another open source based company or maybe they're going to work on other open source based technologies. So their passion for it, like you can't, or at least I can't think of a way that you could say, oh, well, we're, we're even more open source now. Now with 110% extra open source. Like it, uh, I don't but the reverse think is that... true. Yeah. There are companies, we're not going to name names this time, which <laughs> uh, have a much more kind of holistic approach to open source. Uh, mm -hmm. They take open source and then take it inside, do stuff with it and never commit anything back. And I would assume from this report that they will have a problem with retention because on the one hand, they need open source minded people to deal with that stuff that they're taking inside, but by not being passionate about open source themselves and making it closed, these people typically won't remain there because they don't see a shared passion for open source from mm -hmm. themselves and the company they're working for at that point. So you're right. I don't see that some as a way of retaining people. But the inverse is a way of expelling people. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. So again, kind of moving on a little bit, there's a, a, a really interesting stat I quite like. 50% of professionals ranked the ability to architect solutions based on open source software as being the most valuable skill with experience contributing to an open source project uh, close behind at 48%. And this, this to me is, is really interesting because I think this goes back to exactly what you were saying earlier on the previous, uh, previous episode. It's, it's not purely about, you know, what you know about a particular technology or how you understand a particular technology, but it's about how you can build a solution out of you know, a number of different components to, to solve a particular problem. And those two skills are related, but they're actually quite different. And the, you know, I can absolutely see why, at, you know, in my opinion, I would, I would be looking for, <laughs> I would be expecting almost a higher percentage of, uh, of people being able to focus on the architecture of, of solutions rather than uh, uh, rather than just anything else, but that's that's me. That's my my particular focus. Yeah, I've got a bit of a question there with the uh, 
uh, ability of architect solutions based on open source software as the most valuable skill. Uh, mm -hmm. Do they mean the most uh, sellable skill, the, the skill that brings me the most uh, job offers? Because I don't see as a professional why I would value one skill over the other, maybe in what I want to attain. I don't know, it's a bit of a weird phrasing for me, mm -hmm. but I do agree with the concept. Uh, being able to architect solutions based on it is a step higher, an abstraction yeah. level, level higher. It requires the knowledge, or at least the capacity, capability of ingesting new technology quickly and rapidly and correctly to be able to mm. plug them into these architectures and both and being able to have kind of a, a high level view of things without getting eaten up all the details because a lot of very technical people, very smart people, they see a new shiny and they go very deep in it. And there's never an end, it can, always, it can always go deeper, but they never do anything with it. And then you have these little, I don't know, hobby projects that kind of start up where, oh, and now I spend so much time on this thing, so I, not, I have to make something with it. So, hey, I build a dashboard. Yeah. Well, it's much more interesting to have, maybe not as deep, and some people need the deepness because you need people to actually do the thing at that level too, of course. But yeah. being able to have that higher level view and being able to see how things interconnect, what the dependencies are, what the consequences are, certain choices, that's also a very important skill and uh, I would say more valuable skill because it's definitely better, uh, a more marketable skill in the job market. Yeah. The, the next one uh, in, this, uh, in this trio of, of stats though is, is something that I'm honestly surprised it's not, uh, it's not a higher number and for for a bit of context, I've been in open source for well over 20 years at this point. Um, I, you know, all, all of my roles in the last two decades have been open source oriented in some way, shape or form. And so 58% of professionals report that they work in open source because it runs modern technology and that working in the field makes them more employable. Now, I must admit when I first scanned through this, um, I thought it said it makes things more enjoyable. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, it really does. And I, I mean, I, I, I would actually stand behind my inability to read there. Um, I, I really do think that open source is a fun, interesting, dynamic, um, and rapidly evolve, always rapidly evolving, um, kind of part of the tech world. And whether you're, you know, regardless of what part of, of the open source ecosystem you're, you're looking at, I'm personally far more interested and excited about what's going on in a whole variety of open source areas than I am about the majority of what I see going on in you know, what I think of as the proprietary world. Um, so I just thought that was kind of a, a, a fun misreading. Yeah, but there's an interesting statistic there because I think it's also fairly recent because for a long time open source was used when projects need to do things on a shoestring budget and there wasn't any money to buy the good stuff but you could have this download somewhere and somebody will make it work so for a long time the open source things were done as a as ghetto stuff really low mm. budget low i have no resources i need to make this thing work so let's do it open source and make the best of it that has clearly changed. I mean, open source has yeah. been a driving force now in the world. It's it's no longer the, the ghetto. It's the top of the line these days. Uh, commercial software is trying, scram, scrambling to keep up with open source these days. Yeah. So that is definitely a change there. Now, making it more employable, we talked about this in depth already. It's not going to rehash that one. Mm -hmm. Making it more enjoyable, I think that also depends on the kind of person you have. Because if I step mm -hmm. outside of my little bubble of reality distortion, I do like the term, then I do encounter sufficient people who are so uh, who are risk averse, because mm. any kind of step into open source entails a little bit of risk. Not mm -hmm. in the oh my god, maybe it's not going to work, because that risk is valid always, <laughs> even if you don't not do open source. There's always possibility there, but the risk of maybe I need to 
admit that I don't know something. Because mm -hmm. with closed source software, they have a slower cycle of innovation, less re releases, you read the manual and you can say, no, I are an expert. With open source, you never reach that point. There's always something else, something you didn't read, you didn't, you missed, you didn't fix, you didn't make the connection or something like that. It is a living, breeding animal you need to chase all day long. And that's what makes it enjoyable for some people, but mm. makes it a very big dragon for other people. And particularly, and this may just be my own small sample bias, but enterprise architects have a large dose of that. And from one hand, I can understand it because if they make a mistake, it's very visible. It's very career threatening perhaps, but that's where I still see a lot of less and less, but if there's a one layer in the whole IT that I can pinpoint as being the, the blocking factor more than the CTO and the CEO at this point is enterprise architecture. And that's mm. again related to this, what we talked about this earlier, being able to architect things based on open source, very valuable skill and a fairly rare skill still today. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's one more piece of this puzzle just, uh, as we wrap it up and that is, uh, diversity, uh, equity and inclusion. And it's, it's a big part of, um, modern hiring, uh, and it's kind of disturbing that there's such a delta between um, what employers say that they're doing and what uh, professionals uh, say at those organizations say that their company is doing or what they believe their company is doing. Do you find it unexpected? Uh, sadly, no. Um, I think the, I, I do think it's good that employers are, um, ahead and are setting the, the standard. And I do think it's, it's great that it's 98%. I would really hope that it would be a hundred percent in this day and age, but it's not. So still work to do. Um, I mean, the church is an employer too, right? It's Catholic church. <laughs> Sure. Um, I don't know how much open source they use. So if, if you're listening to this uh, podcast and you work uh, in Bible the open source, isn't it? Yeah, there you go. Um, oh, God. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so the, the thing that I think is problematic about this is that if you've got 98% of employers saying that their company proactively encourages diversity in hiring and only 75% of professionals at that organization um, say that their company proactively encourages diversity in hiring. Well, who do you think does the hiring? Is it this nebulous thing called the company, the employer? No, it's not. It's, it's actual people that do that the very professionals that we're talking about so like if a company has a policy and yet a reasonably significant percentage of people either don't recognize that policy don't understand that policy don't know that policy exists <laughs> like then it's ineffective for that percentage of people that's nearly well, yeah, it's nearly 25% of professionals basically don't, don't believe in that or don't, don't believe their company is doing that, which I, I don't know. I, I just, as a, as a hiring manager, I struggle to believe that in this day and age, but that's the numbers. Um, that's the stats. Yeah. I think there's also a bit of the, a bit of old world stuff in there. And just anecdotally, I've been binge watching uh, yes, minister yesterday and there was an episode there about gender equality and the, the main message there was in principle we all agree we should have equal opportunity stuff but in my department of course i can't and i think that still is valid today the employer as a entity organization of course we want to have equality and all the rest Yes, yes, we see all the positives. Great, great, great. And then that filters down and then you will get some, yeah, 
harder not to crack, literally, mm. <laughs> um, for, <laughs> for people saying, yeah, yeah, I agree that, but in my department, obviously we can't because, and there's gazillion reasons people will throw up at that point. I mean, let's be positive. Let's 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 for a change. I'll be positive and see it as a growth. It is it's yes. going up. It's going the right yeah. direction. And yeah. um, at a certain point, it's going to go too far, and it's going to be the pendulum. And let's see if it swings out of control or it goes to a nice, correct median somewhere. But uh, it's going the right way. Let's say let's call it that. And I mean, the wording yeah. is very specific. Proactively encourages. Mm -hmm diversity and hiring we're not talking mandating we're not talking you know anything excessive here we're just saying proactively encourages diversity and hiring now yeah. you could Vogel's argue also does that right <laughs> yeah i guess but i think you're you're right the like 10 percent increase year on year on year well not quite year on year because we don't have it all the years in there but like 2018 2020 2021 it goes from 79%, 88%, 98% in terms of employers' focus. And, you know, it is trending in the right direction for the professionals. It's gone from 60% to 70% to 75%. Again, the fact that there's a, a smaller growth between 2020 and 20, 2021, understandable because the previous gap was between 2018 and 2020. Yeah, and 5 honestly... Year you know encouraging diversity in hiring has been a thing for quite some time it has come into more and more stark contrast and stark focus over the last couple of years so it doesn't surprise me that that has uh, that has continued to grow but you know it, it's always at least in the times that I've been hiring it's always been something that I've tried to do have I always been successful no um, yeah, but I mean, don't answer this, but would you hire a less qualified person if it means you have more diversity? I mean, how no. fair is that? I mean, it's you, a hard you, thing. You always need to you always need to hire the right person for the job, regardless of all these other things. The challenge with encouraging diversity in hiring is like we are two white males talking on a podcast yeah we are kind of the, the worst example yeah <laughs> um we've talked honestly we've talked or i specifically have talked for years at this point about doing a diversity in tech episode or set of episodes mm -hmm. and we have still not done it and it it a lot of it is basically because it comes back to we're two white dudes talking about about this we would need you know a number of guests that would represent that diversity now we definitely have people in our network that would be that have have volunteered like we've gone as far as like drawing up a bit of a list of people that would that would come on the podcast and would happily talk about these topics um but it's, a risky it's topic. it is it's a very it's, it's very, very hard to do right and not for be a lot of people. patronizing yeah. on the whole thing and that's that's yeah. a problem that is yeah. a problem yeah it is it is and uh yeah I, I mean if if you're listening to this and if you think that you'd like to you'd like to hear that episode um let us know i'm genuinely genuinely interested in our audience's uh, thoughts on this and whether they'd like to hear us put something like that together because as i say i've been talking about this literally for years yes. at this point it's been so, on the to, on the list of things you want to do for a long time yeah <sighs> anyway so, just going yeah. back to the, the graph there, the delta, I, I think, will always exist because the employers are marketing the positives and the yeah. professionals are experienced the negatives and they have a bias there. So there's always going to be a delta there. It just hopefully will shrink over time. Indeed. Indeed. And really, I, the, that's, for the most part, that's it. The The conclusion, you know, maybe maybe I was a bit a bit too... Uh, a bit too negative when I when we, we started this uh, a 
in the previous episode, I, I sort of, I remember reading it and thinking, oh God, this is, this is all very, very doom and gloom. It's, it's not all it's doom not. and gloom. Um, I do think, you know, as we've gone into this in more depth and especially as we've spent some time talking about it, um, there is a lot of positivity here. There is a lot of, um, good news here. There is a lot of things that I think those of us that have spent time in open source can be proud of the yeah. fact that we're part of this, this movement, this evolution, um, this revolution, maybe God, uh, um, but there's still, you know, there's still a lot of work to do and there will always be, I think a lot of work to do. Like this is it much like open source itself. This is never done. Like we, 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 we're never done with, Oh, we've, we fixed open source jobs. Like it's all sorted. <laughs> you fixed open source. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It just doesn't happen. Mm. Um, but I don't but, think we're, we reached a point in time where we are no longer the pioneers. We can now kind of sit in oh, the, yeah. in the pub and show the battle scars and talk about the old days where we had to fight for every scrap. Now it's just, it's, it's arrived. It's there. It's going the right way. It's having a positive effect of, on culture, on economy, on, go, on government. It's, it's, life is good. My Indeed. God. Indeed. <laughs> and there's Jon ending on a positive note. <laughs> yes, I just noticed that. Uh, let's, uh, unless you have anything else to add, let's quickly put a cork in this one. Yeah, let's wrap it up. All right, then. then that's all the time we have for today. You can support this podcast. You can become, become, become a Patreon. Contributions do help us keep this pod podcast running after all these years. If you're on YouTube, you can like, subscribe, hit notification bells, and more importantly, see all the nice graphs we've been talking about in these episodes. If you just do mm -hmm. the MP4, you're missing all that goodness. I spend a lot, of, a lot of effort on this video stuff. Please, throw me a bone. You can go to www.rollingalpha.org. There's links there to the Patreon page, YouTube page, and other stuff about the podcast. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter using the at Rolling Elf and tag, and you can send feedback by email to podcast at roaringelfant.org. Again, if you have any feedback regarding our potential equality show, let us know. If you want to be on that episode, let us know. Reach out, please. Until next time, my name is uh, Old Battle Scar Jon. And my name is Come Join the Revolution, Comrade Dave. And we look forward to talking to you all together again next week. See you then. Bye-bye.